Hi guys, sorry, I'm just having um, some issues with my laptop. Ellie, could you just welcome people a second, please? Hi everyone, welcome. Um, just while Sam sorts out the slides there. Um, so it all goes okay. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I had there was music playing out of my laptops from somewhere, and I was like, "Where's that coming from?" So, welcome everybody um, to um, day. I don't even know where we're at. We're on week two of the Fair Education Impact Festival now, um, I, and welcome to this session on um, legal structures for your organisation. Um, and I think we've got two attendees here today. So, Hannah and Alison, uh, welcome. Um, and we have um, Rachel Southern and Megan Jones here from Batesville Braithwaite who will be leading this session. Um, as you both know, I think Hannah and Alison, you, you've both been to a few of the other Impact Festival sessions, haven't you? Um, so I, I was going to go over the whole um, spiel at the beginning um, and break us into breakouts, but as there's only two of us, I think Vanessa's just joined as well, um, I thought we could make it a bit more of a personal experience today. Um, so I don't know, Alison, um, do you want to come off mute and introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about where you're at in your journey of deciding a legal structure for your organisation? 
Yeah, so um, I set up, I've set up a limited company um, and um, it's, it's just the beginning, but under that umbrella of the limited company, I've also set up various other sort of, there are various projects happening underneath it. Um, including um, developing this social media platform and at the moment I'm not sure whether to keep the social media platform under the umbrella of the limited company or whether to set it up as a separate entity completely and I know BWB pretty well because you guys used to give uh, you were the um, the law firm that supported the map that I was CEO of so uh, it's good to see you here okay thank you Welcome, Alison, and thanks so much um, for sharing, and it's great to have you here. Um, and Hannah, um, have you been to some of the other Impact Festival sessions, and do you want to introduce yourself and share where you're at with your legal structure journey? Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah. Um, this is my first session I've joined, actually. I just learned about the festival yesterday, so really excited to see all the sessions happening. Um, so I'm trying to set up an organisation called Cut the Mustard, which um, enables all pupils in the UK to have access to a range of extracurricular activities. Um, I'm currently really unsure about whether I should set up as a charity, more specifically a CIO, or if it would be easier perhaps to set up initially as a CIC. Um, I have to apologise in advance, I've got three young children running around at home, so I may have to mute myself and turn my video off at times, so please um, apologies in advance if that happens. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome, Hannah. And so great that you've heard about the festival and the awards um, uh, just yesterday, just in time for the festival. So um, <laughs> I'll share some information about the awards um, shortly. Um, and Vanessa, um, welcome to you. So um, have you been to any of the festival sessions and where are you at with your legal um, structure journey? Hi, so Yeah, thank you. I have been to a few sessions last week, which is great. Um, quite a few of them on impact reporting. Um, the Parents' Guide to helps parents of teenagers understand what the choices are at 16 and 18 so that they can give great advice and support at home to their children about what options uh, they should take. Uh, the company has been going for a couple of years now. We are a limited company. I was quite resistant to set up as a charity uh, partly because I don't ultimately want to have to answer to a board in terms of we started from scratch and I really do want the organisation to be me and my business partner um, sort of at the spearhead. At the moment, it is just the two of us. The problem with that is that we don't qualify for a number of grants because technically we're not a charity. Uh, so I was really interested today to hear some background um, on the different options and the pros and the cons. And I know I can create a char charity subsidiary under this limited company. Um, but again, I'm not too sure about that. And I have reservations about taking that route. So really interesting to hear some overview would be helpful. Fantastic. Welcome all. And then just to introduce the other people on the call. So we've got Naomi here, who is um, working with us at the moment um, and is a young ambassador from the I Will campaign. Naomi, do you want to share a quick news to yourself? Yeah, I can do. Um, so, yeah, I um, am an I Will campaign ambassador, but I'm doing a bit of work um, around youth engagement with the FEA at the moment. Um, but I also run a youth led project. Um, called Project Hope at the moment and um, we're kind of exploring our own legal structures at the moment so I'm um, really interested in this session. It's Naomi and then we've got myself Ellie and Lauren from the FEA team doing all of the support. Um, so I'll hand over, um, so welcome Alison, Vanessa and Hannah, I'll hand over to Rachel and Megan now um, for the session um, and then we'll be back over to us at 12.25 to wrap up and I'll share more about the awards then. Thanks. Amazing. Um, thanks so much, Sam. I am going to get our slides up. And whilst I do that, Megan, do you want to introduce yourself and, and I'll work out the slides? Sure. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm an uh, associate in the charity and social enterprise team at Bates Wells. Uh, I'm also in, within our sort of educational sub team um, and our public services sub team. So I do a lot of work with um, public services mutuals, spinning out services from local authorities, various educational organisations, including 
multi-academy trusts, but also just charities with educational objects and bits of safeguarding work and that kind of stuff. Um, I've been with the firm, gosh, maybe four years now, and nearly five years PQE. And um, outside uh, of all that, I'm very interested in sort of the educational space. So I'm part of our social mobility group. Um, and I'm one of the leaders of that in, within the firm. And then I'm also a school governor for a primary school, um, a community primary school um, in West London. Um, and I'm a mentor at the University of Law for law students. So very interested in all things educational and sort of social mobility. Thanks, Megan. Um, and I'm Rachel Southern. I am also an associate in the charities um, team, similarly to Megan, specialising in education. I um, was previously a Teach First um, English teacher at a school in Liverpool, um, and I'm a member of the Teach First Ambassadors in Business Network, and I am a trustee of an arts education charity called Young People's Puppet Theatre, which works to um, bring high quality creative education into the primary schools. So, um, and both Megan and I have um, spoken at a, a number of Fair Educational Rights events and we're super excited to be here today. And we always find it really inspirational to hear about the different ventures that FEA members are, are, are thinking of, of setting up. So um, given that there's a, a sort of smaller number of you today um, and, and that we've had that background from you all in terms of where you're up to, we'll, we'll hopefully have a bit more time for questions and, and, and we, can, we can hopefully tailor it a little bit more to, to what you're um, particularly after, but we'll we'll run through our our slides and which will which touch on lots of the the things that you have been raising, and then we'll just make sure that we leave some breathing space for you to reflect on what that means for you and whether you've got any particular questions. So, just to to give a sort of overview of what we're aiming to do today, this session is aimed at, at organisations that are at the sort of preliminary stages, or sounds like maybe some of you are at more reflection stages as you're about to um, take stock and think about whether your structure, which you have at the moment, really is right for you. And it's, it's here to help you make sure that you have the formal legal structure around your idea, which can really allow you to thrive so that it's not just you doing it, doing the operations, entering into contracts, in your own name but so that you have something formal um, set up and that you have the right entity set up to achieve all that you want to achieve and I can I can see from from the instructions that you've gave the given that you have done lots of research yourself and I'm sure you you're finding that there are there are more options than people maybe realize when they first start thinking about this and there's lots of jargon and there's lots of sources and what we're hoping to do today is really distill some of that down for you into key decisions, key factors to consider, just to help give you a bit more of a framework um, to so that you can take the research that you've done and then really hone in on the right decision for you. And we'll be breaking it down into some of the key decisions. One that, um, uh, that, that you all sort of touched on is that that crucial decision of whether or not it is right for you, for your organisation to be a charity. So quite a lot of the focus will be around that key question, but then we'll also break down some of the sort of sub questions within that. So we will skip through this because we, we had the advantage of, of hearing from each of you, but just um, as a kind of starter slide, the sets out some of the factors that you should be thinking about when you come to decide on the right legal structure for you. And I'm not going to talk to each of them now because I would just run through the whole of us. And these are things that are going to come up as we, as we think. Hmm. Megan, can you hear me? We're just having some problems with your sound, I think, Rachel. Um, 
I'm going to just bear with me and I'm just going to move on to my phone um, hotspot rather than my Wi-Fi. Okay, I'm going, I've changed internet, so is that a little better? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, brilliant. Um, I don't know why it does that every time I'm doing something important, but that's, that's <laughs> it's inevitable, I think. Um, so yeah, so this is um, a slide that sets out the different factors that you will be thinking about when choosing the right structure to you. And we're gonna be touching on lots of these as we work through our presentation today. So what I think that this slide will be most useful for you is a sort of memory aid for you to refer back to after the session um, when you're sort of pulling together everything that we've discussed and thinking about the next step for your organisation. This will be a kind of a reference for you of the different things that you should be bearing in mind in choosing your structure. But for now, it's really here just to demonstrate the breadth of, of issues that you do need to think about in choosing the right structure it is a complex decision and there's that there's there's going to be different factors pros and cons of the of the different things the different options so ultimately it's going to be a prioritization exercise for you in terms of which is the key um the key things that you need your entity to do for you and just a final introductory slide Okay, final introductory slide. This is just to give you a, um, an overview of the different things that we will be talking about today. So we'll be talking about the big question of whether or not you should be a charity. But as we're going to talk about quite a lot today, being a charity is a status. It isn't a legal structure. So if you do decide to be a charity, then there are different options within that. So you could be a charitable company limited by guarantee. You could be a charitable incorporated organization, which is often referred to as a CIO, and a couple of you touched on, on whether CIOs would be right for you, or you could be an unincorporated charity. So we'll be breaking down those different options. And then we'll also, we'll touch on private enterprise, which is your more kind of traditional company that is there to, to make a profit. And then we'll also talk a lot about social enterprises. And just to say at the start that social and a social enterprise isn't a legal form, it's quite a woolly term that doesn't have a particular legal meaning, but it's generally taken to mean an organisation which is doing social good. And so again, we'll be breaking down the different legal entities which exist under the umbrella of social enterprise and talking about those options, um, both from a more sort of traditional non-profit company, also talking about kicks, community interest companies, which is sometimes seen as the sort of midway point between being a charity and being a traditional company. And then a few more bespoke options, um, which we won't dwell on for too long, um, but we will point, point them out to you in case they, they are of interest to you. Things like community benefit society and cooperative society. So I'm gonna hand over to Megan, who is going to go through um, whether or not your organisation should have an incorporated structure. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So broadly speaking, these structures fall under two categories. Uh, they're either unincorporated or incorporated. And incorporation is going to be one of the key factors that you consider when you think about which structure is going to be right for you. So traditionally, your unincorporated structures are things like a trust, um, or, or you might just have another unincorporated society which isn't set up as a trust, but it has rules and it's not incorporated at company's house. It's not a CIO or a CLG. It sort of comes into being and it has some rules and it has some members. And you often find that with sort of community groups that have come together and just started doing something under rules, but don't have any formal structure around them. Um, and then you've got your incorporated structure, which are, which are the ones that Rachel's pointed to already. So you've got sort of companies limited by shares or guarantee or your CIO structure um, or the community benefit societies and cooperative societies that we'll touch on later. So there are a number of factors to consider, um, but ultimately speaking, oh, you can go back to <laughs> either way, it doesn't matter, <laughs> we can say on either way. So there are a couple of factors to consider and sort of things that typify what, what an incorporated structure is. So if you're incorporated, your structure has a legal personality of its own. 
So that means it's a legal entity in its own right, and it can enter into contracts, um, it can employ staff, it can enter into leases for property, and all of those things are held within the structure itself. If you're unincorporated, you don't have legal personality. So what that means is your, your trustees, those that are running the organisation, will enter into those contracts in their own name on behalf of your unincorporated entity. So it will be on behalf of the trust or on behalf of you know, your unincorporated association. And what that means in practice is that there is less ring fencing of risk. So they are entering into it in their own name and they don't have the benefit of a, of a, a corporate entity um, around them, protecting them. So where you have an incorporated entity, you have something that we refer to as limited liability. So that means that the, the potential losses are limited to those of the company, the value of the company's assets. In, in most cases, unless there's been something like fraud that pierces the corporate veil and means that the courts can reach through that limited entity to the individual directors and try to hold them accountable. In most cases, and certainly where you've got trustees, um, you might be aware of the sort of kids company case that's recently happened <laughs> and the, the way that the trustees in those cases were found to be, you know, they were protected um, and they weren't found to be culpable individually. Basically, it, it offers you a layer of protection financially, but also from potential claims and litigation, um, provided you are acting within your duties as a director or your, your wider duties as a trustee if you're a charity. Um, and there, uh, there are other benefits of being incorporated. So it's sort of well-known structure, financial institutions such as banks um, and lenders feel comfortable and, and, and recognise it. Um, grant funders may well feel more comfortable making a grant to an incorporated entity. It's easier for them. The due diligence is often half done for them because you are registered and you're available on the public register and your accounts are made public. And so they feel more comfortable lending to you. So that's all good stuff. Um, but on the other side of it, you know, that you are, you benefit from more sort of privacy potentially if you're unincorporated because you're not registered and accountable to a regulator in the same way. Um, so your accounts won't be online and your, your, you know, who your directors and your members are might not, not be, you know, your directors won't be online, your members register won't be open to the public at request, those kinds of things. So there may be an argument for being unincorporated, but generally speaking, we would only usually these days set up something that's unincorporated where the risks are quite low. So where you're doing pure grant making activity, maybe it's a small family trust solely making grants, then there might be a place for it to be an unincorporated entity. But generally speaking, we see clients wanting to be incorporated, wanting that protection from risk. And go on to the next one. So these are some potential triggers. So we've touched on some of these points already, but largely it's around entering into contracts, um, expose, exposure to risks, including financial risks, employing employees, borrowing money. And half of that is sort of entering into the contract and being able to have a legal entity that can, can do the job of being the employer or, or being the borrower. Um, and it's also about a ring fencing of risk. Um, so, yes. Great. Um, so we are going to move on to the, the sort of big question of whether or not to be a charity. And so before we dive into that, um, I wanted to pause and just think about what it actually means when we talk about being a charity. So, um, as I've mentioned, a charity isn't a legal structure, so you can't choose just a charity as, as your legal structure. What it is, is a status. Um, so we might talk about it in terms of it being a wrapper, which sits around your legal form, or some people prefer the, the metaphor of it being a badge that, that, that sits on top of your legal form. But it, 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 is, it isn't in and of itself a type of entity. What it is, is a a status which an entity can or, or cannot have. And so in order to be a charity, you have to meet the legal test for being a charity. It's a twofold test that the organisation must be established exclusively for charitable purposes and it must operate for the public benefit. By established entirely for charitable purposes, what we are talking about is the charitable purposes which are set out in statute in the Charities Act. So that includes a list of charitable purposes, but it isn't a closed list. There is um, the facility within the statute for, for additional purposes to go on to be recognised as charitable, recognising that as society evolves, 
what we consider to be charitable will also evolve with that. But to give you a flavour of the, the sort of charitable purposes which do exist, which might be relevant to you, one of the um, most sort of long-standing um, charitable purposes that goes back centuries is the advancement of education and similarly the relief of poverty. And there are also charitable purposes around relief of need and that need might be due to financial hardship, youth, um, ill health, disability, so those, those sorts of things might be relevant. Um, I can't remember who, who, your, all of your names, but um, was it Hannah who was talking about the extracurricular activities um, organisation? So there, there's, a, there's a charitable purpose. Um, it's known as the Recreational Charities Act purpose, and that's around leisure time um, and, and the provision of leisure facilities, providing, provided that that is to, to fulfil a, a specific need in a, in a particular community. So providing extracurricular activities for students who otherwise wouldn't have access to them would probably fall within that sort of charitable purpose. So you have to, and it has to be exclusively those charitable purposes. There can't be advancement of education and something else, which is non-charitable. So that's the first part of the test. And then the second part is that it has to be for the public benefit. So your organisation has to benefit a sufficiently wide section of the public. It doesn't have to benefit the entire public, but it, it has to be sufficiently wide. So um, if, if my law firm Bates Wells had a charity that, that just did, just ha helped out Bates Wells employees, that would, you know, probably not meet the test. Um, but something that's to benefit students in London, you know, would meet the test um, and, and tied to that charities if to be a charity any private benefit must be purely incidental to furthering the charity's purposes so that's the rule that means that if it's you know if the intention of the organization is to make a profit that will be shared among shareholders then you're, you're not going to be charitable so that's the test for charitable whether or not your organization is a charity and then if it meets that test then strictly, once its income exceeds £5,000 a year, there is then a legal obligation to register with the Charity Commission. And you do that through an online application. And then if the Charity Commission agrees that your organisation satisfies the test to be charitable, then it will register you and you'll get your registered charity number at that stage. You can then go on and register with HMRC um, for recognition as a charity in order to get the charitable tax reliefs. So I just wanted to pause on that point because I think that can seem a little bit strange in that I just told you, well, if you meet this test, then there's a legal obligation to be a charity. So why are we talking in terms of a decision about whether you want to be a charity or not? But really, it's because if you decide that charity isn't right for you, then in the way in which you set up the organisation and the way in which it's funded and the way in which it's governed, you won't meet the charitable tests. And so therefore you'll be looking more at the social enterprise, um, non-charitable structures that, that we'll go on to talk about. But um, so that's, that is what charity status means. So then to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of charity status. So the, the massive one, which is often why organisations want to make sure that they are charitable, is the tax advantages that come with charity status. Um, gift aid is a, is a big one. Um, and sure, you when you make donations personally, you, you can opt into gift aid, and then it means that the charity gets another 25%. So that is a huge um, source of income for many charities. There's other tax advantages like um, business rates relief if you're using a premises, stamp duty if you're purchasing a premises. Um, Megan's going to talk about this in more detail, but charities don't pay corporation tax on their primary purpose trading, so trading in furtherance of their objects. So those tax advantages are 
a really fundamental reason that, that lots of organisations want to ensure that they are charitable. Then there is the public perception of charities. Um, I would say most members of the public, if you say to them charity, they will know what you mean. It's very well recognised and it comes with that brand of doing good, being non-profit, achieving something positive in the world. Um, and a lot of that perception and trust comes from the fact that charities have this lock on their assets. So once money or assets go into a charity, they are then locked within that charity and can only be used for that charity's purposes. So even if that charity was eventually to decide to wind up and close, its assets would need to be handed on to another charity doing similar purposes. They couldn't just go off to the founder. And that is what gives charities their particular status and their particular sort of why people are comfortable donating to charities because they have that assurance. And because of that, there is there can be greater access to funding for charities. And I know that's something that one of you picked out when we were, were doing introductions, that you, you can find that when you start looking for grants, that some of those grants are only available if you are a charity and you can give your registered charity number. So that can be another core cool reason why organisations decide to ensure that they're going to meet the charitable test so that they can be charities. Um, and I suppose just a final overarching point, which encompasses a lot of those, is the fact that charities are so well established and recognised by public. If, if you're going to be asking for donations from the public, from grant funders and donors, from, from you know, the, the schools that you are maybe going to work with or um, parents that you're going to ask to send their kids to work with you. And um, it does have that brand that is so well recognised. But with that special status and, and those benefits that charities get in terms of tax reliefs and in terms of public trust comes the, the flip side, which is the responsibilities which come with that. And because of the special position that charities occupy, they are heavily regulated. And we, we would say as, as charity lawyers that they are increasingly heavily regulated over recent years. And that is sort of comes hand in hand with this point about public scrutiny. I'm sure you've noticed yourself that newspapers are increasingly running front page stories about charities. Um, we saw it with Oxfam. We saw it with, um, there were stories about fundraising practices um, a few years ago. It, it is, it's happening more often. And then that is then leading to increasing scrutiny from the Charity Commission. So if you're going to be a charity, you have to be aware that that is the context in which you will be working. When we talk about regulation, so the Charity Commission is the regulator for charities. It's, it's the Charity Commission's job to sort of enforce the law and, and regulation around being a charity. And it has, it does that, by re it releases lots of guidance on different topics and charities are responsible for keeping up to speed with that guidance and implementing that guidance through their operations. And just to give you a flavour of the breadth of that guidance, um, there's no, there won't be time to talk about any of it in great detail, but it covers things like the rules around how charities can do public campaigning and can do campaigning on political issues. It covers things like conflicts of interest, a connection with a non-charity. There's lots of guidance around that. The Charity Commission has its own safeguarding guidance, which takes a very broad understanding of what safeguarding means as protecting all people who come into contact with the charity. And in conjunction with that, it also has a serious reporting regime, which is an obligation on charities to report any serious incidents to the Charity Commission. And that is just a very initial flavour, but there are, there are lots of different guidance notes out there, and you would have to work out which are most relevant to your activities and make sure you were up to speed with them. Um, 
charities also have increased reporting requirements in terms of what they need to report to the Charity Commission, so certain annual trustees report or annual accounts. And then um, there's also trustees duties. So, um, and, and someone mentioned earlier, that one of the, the reasons maybe not to be a charity was this reluctance to hand over control to a board of trustees, because as, as you'll be aware, if you are a charity, it is the trustees of your charity who have the ultimate legal responsibility for that charity. And so it is, they can delegate certain decisions to members of staff, but it is the trustees who have the final say. That is quite a big responsibility for people to take on, especially when you bear in mind that the, the other key thing about trusteeship is this, this fundamental principle of, in charity law that trusteeships are expected to be unpaid voluntary positions. There are exceptions to that, but they are the exception and they're rare and you have to put forward a particular case to the Charity Commission, but generally trustees are expected to act in a voluntary capacity. So you would have to find at least three people who are willing to be the trustees of your organisation and then they would have to be willing to do it voluntary and then it would be them who have um, the sort of legal responsibility for the charity going forward. So that can be something that, that makes people think actually, I'm not sure that this will work for what I'm trying to do. And the final point that's on there is about the lengthy application process. So um, now I assume this is as good a time as any to just give you to just a word of warning about how long it can take to set up a charity. Um, the, the charity, the application is done on the online portal on the Charity Commission's website. And once you hit submit, it's very unpredictable what will happen next. Sometimes if the Charity Commission has a look and is pretty quickly satisfied that, that you're charitable, it can move quickly. But if anything makes the person having the initial look think, oh, they should have a second look by a caseworker, you go into another pile and it's that pile that takes really quite a long time. Say, at the moment, I think we're saying to allow up to six months because the pandemic has further exacerbated resourcing problem like resourcing capacity crunch that was already there at the Charity Commission. So that's just something else to bear in mind. So those are the, the pros and cons of being a charity. Um, and now Megan is going to talk you through, if you are going to be a charity, what are the different options for legal structures under that charity status? Thanks. So you'll see the first two on here are, are in typical incorporated structures. Uh, they've been touched on by a number of you when talking about how you are set up currently or what you might be considering. So that's the company limited by guarantee in the CIA. Um, they share some similarities where you have uh, members who constitutionally would say own, but <laughs> that's not the case for charities. They're constitutionally responsible for the charity. Um, so they are the ones that make key decisions about really the big picture stuff and, and the position is reserved to them under company law for a CLG and then is replicated for a CIO in a number of ways under the CIO regulations. So say um, that organisation wanted to change its constitution, its, its governing document, that couldn't be done without the agreement of the members. So that's the, the constitutional sort of controllers of the organisation. They're like an equivalent sort of to shareholders, but there's no share capital. Um, these, these structures are limited by guarantee rather than shares. Um, and, and, and unless certain decisions are delegated, like changing the name, for example, can be delegated to the trustees, but if it's reserved to the members, then you won't be able to change the name of the organization without their approval. Um, and there are certain particular clauses within your governing document as a charity, which can't be easily changed even with the members approval so Rachel touched briefly on sort of the regulation of the charity commission certain things need charity commission approval so it's not just up to the members it then needs to go to the commission for approval and there are key clauses within your governing document which are, are locked to make sure that you continue to function as a charity as the charity commission see it so that's your objects, so your charitable objects to ensure that you continue to function for charitable purposes and you can't just set yourself up as a charity and then change them to something that is only partially charitable a year later. 
um, and the asset lock within your, your governing document, which is contained in your dissolution clause and also um, the way in which your organisation can benefit those that are involved with it. So you would expect to see an asset lock which says that you can't willy-nilly pay your, your trustees, um, although trustees are entitled to things like reasonable expenses and in limited cases can provide services to the charity. Um, and also that employees wouldn't generally be trustees and, and so you wouldn't generally be paying somebody um, who is a trustee and things like that. But as Rachel already highlighted, there are there are nuances to that. If you wanted to have somebody on your board, perhaps in ex officio capacity, who is one of your employees and you're just paying for being an employee, but you're not additionally paying for their trustee duties, that can be allowed. But you do need permission or you need some kind of power in your governing document to do that. So all of those things would be considered when setting you up to figure out exactly what you need to get out of this organisation and whether we can get all of those things out of it in the governing document and still be charitable in the eyes of the commission. So you have those two layers, we've got your members and then you've got your trustees. And as Rachel touched upon, the trustees are the ones who are making the decisions about the strategy for the organization and the day-to-day -day running. But there may be, there are different structures that you can have and there may be some crossover. And those are common to uh, a company limited by guarantee and also a CIO. So you might have um, the trustees, and the members might be the same people. And that's quite common even nowadays when you have a wider membership. So organizations like the National Trust, for example, have loads of what we would talk about as members, people who sign up to be stakeholders and part of the organization. But you may not want those people to be voting on whether to change your governing document. It may not be practical to have thousands and thousands of members. And so you might say, actually, you involve them in different ways as stakeholders and you share some things with them and you consult them on certain things, but actually they're not constitutional members. So there are lots of different ways of involving other people who might have an interest in your organization without necessarily making them members and it can be quite a nuanced thing. Both companies limited by guarantee and CIO will have a restriction on benefits to the trustees. Um, the large difference between the two is that a company limited by guarantee is first set up with company's house and you then make your application to the charity commission. The advantage of that is that you, end, you can get a structure quite quickly um, without having to wait for the Charity Commission's approval, which, as Rachel has said, can, can take six months, but then equally, I've had stuff registered in the last six months that has been registered within a week, it is massively unpredictable. Um, but that can be a challenge if you're an organisation that wants to get going with what you're doing and you don't want to be beholden to the Commission's timeline. So you can set yourself up as a company limited by guarantee, with charitable objects. Technically, you are a charity, you're just not a registered charity and you can get going on what it is that you need to do while you wait for registration. Um, and, and banks are very familiar with the company limited by guarantee structure and, it, you know, are they happy to lend and that kind of thing. So there's the advantages there. And then the CIO is a structure that was set up just over 10 years ago now, um, specifically for charities. Um, you've got the limited, you know, the incorporated limited by guarantee benefits of the CLG. But you're only regulated by the Charity Commission. You're not additionally set up with Companies House and regulated by them. There's lots of crossover in what the Charity Commission and Companies House require. So I think you, you can overstate the sort of simplicity of being set up as a CIO and how that sort of reduces the burden of, of your sort of administrative duties because it's lots of the same stuff that would need to be filed with them. So every time you change one of your trustees, you would need to let Charity Commission know, same thing you would be letting Companies House know, same way that you'd be filing your accounts, you'd need to file them with both. So you're still needing to produce lots of the same documents, you just only need to file them with one regulator and worry about one regulator's sort of expectations and ways of doing things. People sort of say, you know, the CIO, is it, is it a less well understood form by banks and internationally? Um, I come across that less and less in practice, and I think you can overstate uh, a little bit that that you know all banks aren't comfortable with CIOs. Actually, that's not often the case. Although we do sometimes get asked to say provide a letter when they're setting up to explain to a bank what this is, but that that's quite rare. And there are charity banks like Triodos and you know the charity specialist banks that well understand this and charity sort of departments in the big banks like HSBC that well understand this. So I think that can be overstated. Sometimes the CIO is said to be sort of simpler to run, but as I say, I think that can also be overstated. I think they both have their complexities. Your sort of rule book for a company limited by guarantee is set out in the Companies Act, 
and the CIO has its own regulations, which borrows some of the stuff from the Companies Act and makes some changes to how the way, you know, how you're allowed to pass decisions, and that will all be set out in your governing document. So there, there, are, there are sort of rules and ways of doing things for both. And it's all about really thinking about what you do as an organisation and, and which is the most appropriate structure for you. Historically, we've been saying CIOs are more appropriate for small startup charities that don't want to do lots of paperwork and don't want lots of complexity. And, and, and that's true to an extent, but I, I think it's sort of, it's not that simple. And it's about thinking about what you want to do and what your activities are going to be. You know, you might have an organization that comes to you and wants to set up a charity and they're already running as a kick or all of their directors already sit on boards of companies limited by guarantee and they're well, you know, versed and very comfortable with the CLG structure. And the CIO is like a CLG, but has a lot of its own rules. And in those cases, I often say, go for a CLG if you're comfortable with the governance and the rules and the regulations that go around it. Um, so you don't have to learn something new. So, so there's, you know, the advantages can be overstated. I think there's lots of similarities between the two. And then we touched earlier on unincorporated or trust. So a trust is an example of an unincorporated structure and that's governed by a trust deed um, as its governing document. It's not registered with company's house and its information is not available publicly save for the information that's available on the charity commissions register and the charity commission doesn't make the governing document of an organization publicly available it will set out its objects and it will say who its trustees are and, and it will give some examples of its work and that kind of thing and its accounts but it won't share the governing document so sometimes that can be an advantage but and it doesn't have legal personality separately so we've talked about that but if you had a trust or an unincorporated organization it would be the trustees themselves that are entering into contracts on behalf of the charity you don't have, or you don't have to have your members and your trustees. You don't necessarily have a two-tier structure, although you might see unincorporated organizations, which do have funny two-tier structures that sort of mimic companies anyway. Um, but I don't think that applies to any of you here. It doesn't sound like any of you are sort of operating as unincorporated or want to continue to do that. So I won't dwell on that too much. And then we have some other, you know, there are other structures that are sort of less common, um, but may be appropriate for you. So one that's capable of being charitable as a community benefit society. So this is an example of an exempt charity. So it's an organization that's primarily regulated by a different organization, a different um, regulator, which is the Financial Conduct Authority. So it can be charitable, but it doesn't have to be. So a CBS is broadly an organization that carries on an industry, business or trade. So it's not an entity that is just passive and, and, and makes grants and doesn't do anything. It needs to be engaged in something that's a trade or, or a business. And then that trade or business or industry is conducted for the benefit of the community. And that's a wider test than public benefit, the public benefit test that, that Rachel was discussing. But it may be that you could be a CB, CBS that was set up for community benefit, but actually what you're doing within the community is narrow enough that it falls within the charity's commission's definition of what public benefit is. And you could also be a charity and get all those tax exemptions and the charity status if you wanted it. It can be quite a good uh, structure for, for people who don't necessarily know. They know they're going to be benefiting the community, but they don't know whether they will also be charitable. And it gives you the option of later registering yourself as a charity without changing your structure if you find out that actually what you do is charitable. Um, it's generally, it's limited by shares, um, but the shares have a sort of, they're community shares and they're governed by different rules to, to a sort of company limited by shares. Um, and so it, it's, it's sort of got its own rules and you're, you do most of your, because you're exempt, you don't have to file as, as many things with the Charity Commission. So you do your primarily your filings with the FCA. The FCA are quite streamlined and easy to deal with if you can ever get anybody on phone. So there are different pros and cons and it's something to potentially think about but often the membership is drawn from the community and those who are engaged in the services or receiving the services that are provided by the organization. And it's thought of as being quite democratic because it doesn't matter what your shareholding is, it's generally one vote per member. So you're, you're kind of, it's more equal and it's, it's sort of anchored in the community, but it's a, it's a sort of funny one. We don't set up that many of them. An example might be certain, certain YMCAs or CBSs 
um, and their their business that they carry on is provision of social housing and they're regulated by the FCA and it, and it works for them for that reason because they're providing housing for the benefit of the community um, but it, it, it may not be something that's relevant to everybody. I am um... I don't think we're going to talk to this one because we've we've sort of talked talked at length. Covered most of them, I think. Yeah. Data, so yeah, but it'll be in if we share the slides with you afterwards, then it'll be there for reference. Um, but are you you're going to do trading as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about trading. So trading is another factor that might be a consideration in, in whether you set yourself up as a charity or you know if you are if you do think you're going to be doing some trading there is the option of potentially setting up a subsidiary which Vanessa touched upon the sort of subsidiary or, or sort of sister relationship with a charity and the ways that you might get some of the benefits of being a charity whilst putting some of your activities in another entity that isn't a charity and having a bit more freedom about that so charities uh, and Rachel's touched on sort of tax already can undertake primary purpose trading and ancillary trading but non-primary purpose trading is restricted so primary purpose trading is any kind of trading activity that's exercised in the course of carrying out the primary purpose of the charity so that could be a charity which runs it could be a private school um, which is capable of being charitable charging its pupils for the receipt of the education that it's providing um, the charity commission there is guidance which includes trading carried out to the charity's beneficiaries. So there is charity commission guidance on trading and tax. Um, so it's, it, there, there are more nuances to it, but this, these are sort of the headlines. And then there's ancillary trading, which is also permitted, where it contributes indirectly to the charity's primary purpose and is complementary to it. So it's treated in the same way as primary purpose trading. And the example that's always given is a theater that has a bar <laughs> and it's selling you know, in the, in the intermission drinks or food um, to the same beneficiaries who are attending a play uh, and benefiting from, you know, it's ancillary to those primary purpose trading. And then you've got non-primary purpose trading, which clearly doesn't, you know, it's undertaken to raise funds that may then be put towards the activities of the charity by the charity, but it doesn't directly or indirectly further the charity's purposes. And that can be things like selling branded stationery or t-shirts or Christmas cards. Um, and there's, there's guidance on this, but you can do a little bit of it, but not a lot. Um, and so if you're an organization that thinks you're going to be doing lots of lots of trading and that's how you're going to be raising your money, then actually, it, you know, the charity structure may not be best for you. Or you might want to think about charity structure with a subsidiary. Um, and I think we've got a slide on that next. So this is your possible structure, ways of getting around it. And lots and lots of charities do this. So it may be that you're doing stuff actually that's primary purpose. And I've got quite a lot of education charities that have a subsidiary that carries out lots of their activities, even though they're sort of primary purpose activities, but they could be risky because there might be safeguarding issues or there are contracts with lots of third parties or, or something like that. And so they put it in the subsidiary because it ring fences risk. So there are a couple of reasons why you would have one, but trade is one of them. Um, and so those are some examples of your non-primary purpose trading, so sort of corporate events, if you've got a building as part of your charity assets and you want to let it out for room hire, that kind of thing, you might put those things in a subsidiary. And the benefit of that is that the subsidiary can then donate profits to the parent charity. It can therefore reduce um, its profits down to potentially nothing and not pay much or any corporation tax and it gets a tax benefit um, by doing so and then the parent charity gets all the money that's been raised from all the non-primary purpose activity and has that extra funding to be able to apply to its charitable activities so yes there are as Vanessa touched upon earlier there are there are a number of ways of incorporating a charity into your structure if you believe that a charity is going to bring you some of those benefits and those are benefits that you want um, it doesn't have to limit you um, necessarily from all of the things that you want to do. It's just about structuring your group in a way that makes sense and in a way that allows you to, to gain all of the benefits that you want. And it is entirely possible. It just takes a little bit of thought. So we're we going to have a little, a little break, a little, if anyone wants uh, two minutes, three minutes to sort of stretch your legs, pop to the loo, grab a, grab a quick drink. Um, just because we're, we're conscious it's quite dense, um, but also 
we thought this would be a good time just for a kind of moment to, to take stock. We're in this sort of second half, we're going to be moving on to talking about the more non-charity options. Um, but we thought it might we you could either if you wanted to to unmute yourself and tell us you know what, what you're thinking or or put it in the chat or just make a little note for yourself but um yeah maybe a moment a quick moment to to breathe and and feel free to just sort of stand up and stretch if if you need to um if you are going to do that we'll we'll definitely have started again by by 12 um but yeah, it, but you're also, if you wanted to unmute and just sort of tell us what you're thinking or anything like that, any any clarification questions or anything, then, then please do. I'm actually, I'm going to pop to the loo as well. Great. I can see Vanessa's back. Um, Hannah and Alison, are you are you there? Yep, yeah, I'm still here. Amazing. Um, Alison, are you there? I think Alison might have just um popped out, so I'll just give her just thirty seconds. Rachel, I wonder if it's worth um, Hannah and uh, um, Vanessa, just while we're waiting for Alison, um, do you want to share kind of how, how you're finding the session so far, or if you have any ha have any thoughts that came up in that question that Rachel posed? Thanks, Sam. It's Vanessa here. Um, great session so far. It's super clear, which is wonderful. It's given a really nice overview in super simple format, which is because of my favourite kind of way of presentations. Um, also, because I'm sort of feeling that I've made the right choice about the Social Enterprise Limited Company. Um, so maybe I've got a bias now towards this session. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so far so good. So thanks very much. Great. Yeah, it's always good, even if it's just confirming that you are on the right lines. Sometimes it's just nice to have that reassurance. And um, how about you, Hannah? Yeah, the same. Thank you. You've made it really clear. Um, I think sometimes when I've been researching about the structure of charities, it has been a bit confusing to read lots of different documentation. So it's lovely to hear it in a very simple, um, easy to understand way. So thank you. And I think similarly, um, it sort of confirmed to me that probably setting up as a charity isn't for me so I'm looking forward to hearing your next, your next <laughs> bit. <laughs> Great yeah, that's good you know, sometimes we, we just lose people halfway through who are like yeah charity great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and hi Alison um, yeah we were just sort of um, if you had any questions that had come up from the first half or if it had clarified your thinking on anything it would be great just to hear hear what you're thinking. I think similarly to uh, Vanessa and uh, Hannah, um, I wasn't um, going to go down the charity route um, and your explanation so far has been really, really clear. Thank you for that. Um, but you've pretty much helped me <laughs> confirm that it's not the avenue right. I wish to explore. So uh, thank you. Great, great. That's really good. I feel like that, that was, thanks for asking that, Sam, because that was just a lovely little um, ego boost from you, Megan, halfway <laughs> through. <laughs> good to know that you're all still with us. Um, and also good to know that the, the sort of second half on non-charities is, is going to be um, relevant to you all. And, and as, as we sort of, now that you've 
grappled with that question of whether charity status is right, then you can move on to the to the question of, of okay, well, if I'm not a charity, then then exactly what am I going to to structure? How am I going to structure myself? So, um, okay, so the one key point that I wanted to make um, that I, it sounds like you you have all picked up on is that it it certainly isn't the case that if you're not a charity, then you're you you can't set up an organisation which is primarily designed to be furthering a sort of good social good social purpose there are lots of, of of options which aren't charity status which still embed social mission within the organization but with more flexibility than the charity regime allows and that's what we're going to um, explore so we've got another kind of overview slide up on the screen now which looks at the the different um options that we're going to talk about i am i'm not going to talk too much during the session about companies limited by shares because i just i don't think from what you're saying that 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 is the avenue that you're you're necessarily thinking um a company limited by shares would be the, the sort of traditional company that, that most people who haven't spent time um, researching legal structures for nonprofit entities and social enterprise entities would, would think of when they thought of a company that they would have a, a sh they have shareholders and it's the shareholders who buy shares in the business in return for a financial stake in that business. So when the company makes a profit, it might pay out a dividend to its shareholders um, in the kind of dragon's den style, the shareholders hold a stake in the financial interest of the, of the company. And because of that, it's less common in the sort of non, if you're, if you're more thinking along the, the non-profit social purpose world, because it's, it's, it's prime you know the, the ultimate aim will always be to make a profit for the the shareholders but it it, it it can work and we will touch on the ways in which it can work but I think that from what you were saying earlier you're more interested in the kind of not-for-profit models so one way of doing that is to have a company limited by guarantee which we talked about before in the context of you can have a charitable company limited by guarantee but instead you could have your company limited by guarantee but then not go on and try and register it with the charity commission it can be a non-profit company limited by guarantee but it doesn't have that charity status as a wrapper sitting around it you can still make it explicitly non-profit in the way in which you draft its Articles of Association, which are the governing document for the company limited by guarantee. So you can include, for example, an asset lock within the Articles of Association, which mean that the um, assets held by the company limited by guarantee will only be used for its purposes. And you would draft those purposes so that they were the kind of broad community social mission purpose that you want to further. Um, it's not as strong a safeguard as with a charity, because as Megan mentioned, if you're a charity and you have an asset lock, you can't amend that without the Charity Commission's consent. And the Charity Commission is not going to consent to you taking out the asset lock. But if you just have a company limited by guarantee, which you've drafted to be non-profit with an asset lock, the members of that company could take that out so in that respect you you might find that you know certain grant funders won't be as keen on it as they would be a charity because it is it, it isn't as as rigidly safeguarded as it would be with a charity but nonetheless it can be a very strong um sort of indication of your intent that this is a non-profit entity and you would just, it, they can be set up really quickly. You just register them at Companies House, which can be done virtually overnight um, if, you, if it's on a good day. And, and then you have your company and you, you go forward from there. You, you won't get the tax reliefs that charity get, um, but you, you'll have an entity and you'll be able to, to, to go ahead and, and start running your operations through that entity. 
a sort of a, a, a middle ground, I guess, which doesn't give the same rigid safeguard as a charity, but nor is it as easily changed as just a straightforward company limited by guarantee is a kick or a community interest company um, because that it, that does still have statutory safeguards and I'm not going to talk about that at any length now because Megan has a, a slide where we're going to go through that in more detail but just to sort of give you the sense of how they're all fitting in together and then oh, Megan talked about community benefit societies before so they can be non-charitable um, and then there's also, we mentioned on here, the Cooperative Society. Um, I'm not going to talk at great length about, about co-ops because it's, it, it, to be honest, it's not something that I come across very often. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not particularly um, well versed in them, but they, the, they're there because they, they're for the benefit of their members. So they can be a really good way of tying in sort of community engagement or employee engagement so if that those are ringing bells with you that's that's something you might be interested in then that might be something you go off and and think more about but I think the the main things that we're going to be thinking about for you as non-charities but that are non-profits for the social good are going to be a non-charitable company limited by guarantee and a kit but just to sort of close off that point about the different types of company, um, this slide just talks about the difference between a company limited by guarantee and a company limited by shares. Um, so I think I've talked about uh, quite a bit of this, but um, just to rattle through it again, a, a guarantee company has members, whereas a share company has shareholders. And the shareholders have a financial interest in the company in that they will invest in the company in return for shares and then they will expect to take dividends when that company makes profits. Members don't have that financial stake but as Megan put it earlier they have a constitutional stake in the business in those constitutional powers to amend the company's articles of association or wind it up or change its name or remove its directors. Um, the reason you, that people tend to go for a company limited by shares, if that's what's right for them, is in order because of the way that they can raise finance. So they can do that by selling shares in return for a stake in the company. And that is what's sometimes referred to as equity financing. Debt financing is taking a loan. So, so most typically a bank loan. And that is what we refer to as debt finance and that could be achieved in either a company limited by guarantee or a company limited by shares. You might find that you can get grants for a company limited by guarantee um, but you, um, you probably won't for a company limited by shares. Um, I think I'm going to let Megan talk about kicks just to make sure that we give that the time that it needs. So I'm going to move over to that slide. So we just thought it'd be helpful to have a slide that set out in a bit more detail. A couple of you have touched on a kick might be right for you. Um, and as Rachel has mentioned, it's a sort of middle ground. It, it does work with, with shares as well as um, by CLG. So you, you can have both options. Um, so you're, you're again set up to fill a community purpose. Um, and that is a sort of, it has a specific meaning, but it's wider than um, charitable purposes, which are restricted to those 13 heads of charity, you know, if we've talked about some of them, education, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and although you might be doing something, for example, in the education space, it gives you that sort of wider ability to have slightly wider purposes and be a bit more free about what you're doing. And that might be helpful if you haven't decided exactly what you're gonna be doing or how you're going to be doing it yet, it can give you a bit more freedom. But in order to set yourself up, you will need to explain to the kick regulator how you're going to benefit the community um, but it's not hugely onerous it's a much much quicker process than setting up a charity um, so you have to have particular articles that are kick articles they borrow bits of what you would see in a charity or a non-profit articles and then they have some specific provisions such as the asset lock which I'll touch on in a minute um, and then you provide what is it called a kick 36 statement um, and we often help clients draft those but they are certainly something that you could prepare yourself if you're kind of 
comfortable and you know what you're going to be doing and you use the right kind of language, actually it's much easier for you to do that by yourself. Whereas the charity application form has kind of mushroomed over the years into quite a large undertaking and charity commission has got quite a fixed idea of what it wants to see and the kind of language that it wants to see. Um, whereas the kick regulator, much like everything a company's house is, is just a lot more, we we'll use the word relaxed. It's not that they don't care but they are relaxed. <laughs> so that's kind of reassuring, I think, to a lot of organisations that are running. You're running an organisation, you want to get on with what you're doing. You, you know that there are rules, but you don't want to be sort of, you, you want a regulator that is appropriate. And, 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 you know, the company's house is more light touch than the commission. Not that the commission's always unfair, but they do scrutinise more. Um, so you, you will always have this thing, which is your, your lock on assets. And what it does is it prevents the kick from transferring its assets for less than market value. So giving it away for free or for less than it's worth um, to anybody else, unless that is another kick or a charity. And the way that it's structured is that you can name in your articles other asset lock bodies. Those are called a specific asset lock body that you might give your funds to and you wouldn't need any special permission for that. So that can work quite well if you are associated a kick in a charity, if you've got some kind of complicated structure or you've got some kind of relationship with a particular organization. So at the moment I'm working with a kick that has a relationship with a particular university. It receives lots of funding from that university and works quite closely with it. And it's got it named as a specific asset lock body um, in its articles. And the kick regulator doesn't, you know, it, there are certain requirements in order to be an asset lock body, you need to have those same provisions. So uh, Rachel touched upon, for example, a non-profit could have an asset log in its articles. You could be a registered society like a CBS or a, a co-op society. Those often have an asset log in them. So they're quite broad. It's broader than just giving to charities. Um, or you can give away your, your, your assets for other, not, not to an asset log body, but for a community purpose. So actually you have the asset log, which is there to protect your funds and, and your community purpose, but it's much less rigid than the asset lock that you would see in charity articles, which basically say you can't give it away to anybody unless it furthers your very specific charitable objects. It is wider, it is more flexible, so lots of people like that. You're regulated by Companies House only, and it's a specific section of Companies House, the kick regulator sits within Companies House, but it does mean that it's more joint, it is quite joined up and they function in, in much the same way. You kind of know what you're going to get with Companies House and the way in which they regulate. Um, you need to report annually, so you still need to do your annual accounts. And with that, you need to submit a statement that lets them know how you've been benefiting the community in the last year, sort of in line with your original objects, but it's not, it's not too painful. <laughs> so the advantages are, as we've said, less regulation and greater flexibility. Um, as relatively quick, quick and easy to set up, um, you still benefit from your limited liability, so it gives you that protection. One of the great things is directors can be paid without needing to have a special power in the articles, provided it's reasonable remuneration. So if you are in a position like Vanessa, for example, where you're a founder and you want to be running it and you want to be paid, you need to take a salary, as lots of people are, this provides you with a structure that where that's all OK, you don't need special permissions to do it. You just need to make sure that it's a reasonable amount that you're being paid and that you're documenting that. Um, and you can, if it's a share organisation, pay out a portion of your profits to your shareholders. So it gives you that kind of halfway house where if you want to be able to raise equity, um, you know, investment funding from shareholders. And that can that can serve a number of purposes, you know, just not just funding. It can be a way of engaging particular people with your organisation, having them as shareholders and owning a stake. Um, then it enables you to distribute some of your profits to them, but it caps it at currently 35%, but that is something that, that can change um, under the regulations, the community interest country, com uh, company regulations, but I don't think that's changed for years. Um, that, that proportion has existed for a long time. And you benefit from this social enterprise brand. So people know about kicks, kicks have a certain reputation, I think, and it, it gives you not necessarily the same as charity prestige, but it's something that you can kind of hang your hat on. I think people know what it is and they know what to expect from it. And, and it gives you a certain kind of positive um, notoriety that can hopefully boost your branding and help tell the public and potentially fund as what you're about. Um, you can receive statutory funding. You, there are certain, you may find that you'll get more grant funding as a kick than a non-profit um, CLG or and certainly 
you know, just a commercial CLS or CLG. So there are certain grant making bodies that only want to give to charities. Um, and as we talked about before, they're, they're kind of more comfortable with that. They know you're regulated by the Charity Commission, it ties up their due diligence and, and that's what they're comfortable with. But there are others that will consider giving to you as a, as a kick. Um, and that can be quite helpful to have that and open up the, the door to some grant funding there. Um, and you can make grants yourself. So the kick regulator does have powers to intervene. Um, and so you are regulated, but as we've discussed, it is more light touch. I think it's more straightforward and easier to follow the rules. Kick regulator has some guidance, but the guidance came out when the kick kicks were set up initially, and it's like a six chapter thing. It's not reams and reams of loads of different guidance like the Charity Commission has, it's constantly being updated. So it's slightly more in terms of scale, I think manageable and easy to get to grips with. You don't get charitable tax relief. So if that's a key thing for you, that can be a real deal breaker for some people. And so this is just a sort of summary. We've covered lots of this already, but it's about thinking about what's right for you. So if you want to carry out broader activities, if you know that you want to carry out lots of purpose, which uh, trading, which would be non-primary purpose trading, but you still want to have some kind of social status, then a kit could be a good option for you. Um, and we, we can whiz on to B Corps and then we can make sure we leave five minutes for questions. So B Corp, a little bit like charity status, I suppose, is like a sticker or a label that goes on top of your structure. Lots of structures are eligible to apply for it, but ironically, not charities. So <laughs> you can't have both, but um, it's sort of becoming more and more well-known. As you can see at the bottom there, lots of well-known brands are B Corps and Bates Wells is also a B Corp. Um, I think the first and maybe still the only law firm in the UK to be a B Corp. So it's a status rather than a structure. And what it does is it requires a change to your governing document to basically codify your commitment to a number of things and the way in which you're going to operate. So there are specific standards in relation to social and environmental performance, uh, transparency, legal accountability, various things, considering your stakeholder interests, um, looking after your employees, and basically balancing that with a for-profit purpose, so not putting profit alone at the heart of everything that you do. And it tells the rest of the world that you're committed to all these things and also you are held to a standard so it's sort of a kite mark in that you do have to submit um, information every year and they reevaluate whether you're you can still be a b corp and also you get like extra points like there are some b corps that are better performing b corps than others and and, and that's one way of demonstrating to society that that you're, you know, you're committed to having a positive impact on society the environment your employees etc and holding yourself to a standard um, but maybe not the standard of a charity, but this may be a better fit and another way of signifying to the world just your social commitment. And then we can move on to our final slide, which is a lovely sliding scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think this is just <laughs> to encourage you to sort of think about, although I suppose it's not necessarily that linear, there are lots of sort of grey areas in between, but thinking about as an organisation, where do you sit? What are your priorities? Um, what are you wanting to do for the world? What are your activities actually going to be and what's that going to look like in practice? And then, you know, like Vanessa said, all of the nitty gritty about actually how's this going to work? Who needs to be paid? Who's going to be making the decisions? What freedoms do we need? Uh, and balancing that all up to figure out what's the best fit for you. So I think we've got a couple of minutes um, either for people okay, to say what to they think. Sharing or, so we can see. Yeah, we can see each other's faces. Um, but if you've got sort of specific questions or there's anything that's been thrown up by that and you want to to, to sort of dig a little deeper, please do ask away while we're here. I also have a quick apology to make that um, I assume Naomi was here as staff because she's working with us um, at the moment with the Fair Education Lines, but Naomi's actually um, uh, leading her own initiative, Project Hope, so was here from the capacity of thinking about legal structures for Project Hope as well. So just wanted to clarify that. And um, Naomi, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in as well. Or if you've no questions, it'd be nice to just hear what you think you're going to go away and, and do and, and what your sort of next steps and, and where you're at, whether anything's changed and where you're at with your thinking. I suppose one thing that's worth noting, and we've done a bit of research on it, but we didn't put it in because it'd be too long, mm. is that actually, although we make a big meal of this is an important decision, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it is. But no decision is the only decision you're ever going to make. And your organisation will grow. 
Um, so it may be lots of organizations that don't know what they're going to do, start off as a start off as a CLG nonprofit, and then we see where it's going to go. Um, or you might find later on you've been a kick, but actually you think now I want to be a charity. And there are absolutely ways. Some there are some direct routes for converting one structure into another. And then there's always a, the route of setting up a fresh structure and transferring stuff across uh, or making one the subsidiary of the other so that they can function essentially as one. So don't I wouldn't be overly worried. There are always routes to where you need to get to if that changes or, or if your objectives change. It's not the only it's not the only chance that you get to make that decision. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for making it so clear. I think it's really confirmed to me that I need to set up as a cook. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there are uh, on the um, the slides, which I think you you get a copy of afterwards. There um, there's some useful resources at the end, and I think the links to the the like kick guidance and the kick model articles and things are on there. And as Megan mm. says, it's, it's probably a one that you know with a kind of focused day of going through the documents you can you can do on your own yeah or it's the kind I'm of thing that you can get quite out the slides as, as as default so if you do um so if the four of you do want the slides do you want to just put your hand up now and we'll make we can pass your emails to Rachel and Megan and yeah. um sure. and those on that's great Ellie could you just make a note um have we if we've got all your emails which we do we can pass them to Rachel and Megan and then um that's all fine with GDPR is that all right Ellie cool perfect thanks I was just um, gonna say that kick is a structure where if you wanted some kind of targeted legal support it would be easier to offer and a sort of potentially a cheaper option um than a charity because again there are there are sort of there is a way of doing it but I think the kick regulator is less strict and they can all be set up online now. I think COVID has actually given companies house a bit of the kick yeah. of the bum and they've made lots of stuff available online. So things are easier, cheaper and quicker to set up. Yeah. Great. Vanessa, is that your hand up for a question? Or is that the hand up for the email? Yeah, it was just the email, um, yeah, to get the slides. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information in there. And the way you presented it was great, guys, because mostly I've been able to take it in, but it'd be great to look, and especially your other resources. So thank yeah. you. Um, well, I suppose we're, we're at time, but just to mention that um, you can check out the, the Bateswell's website also has loads of um, resources um, aimed at the charities and social enterprises. And there's lots of sort of COVID response things around things that we've, we've seen that people have struggled with in, in moving things online or, or, or getting out of contracts or that sort of thing. So, so yeah, do, do check that out if you're... Um, if you're, you're looking for anything and if you you know if you ever we'd, we'd love to stay in touch and hear about your plans so so yeah feel free to drop us a line if you'd if you'd like to be signed up to Bates Wells's marketing then let us know because we run similar to this but we run all through the year various different free trainings that are available to people who sign up whether it's on collaborate contractual collaborations or grant agreements or on employment issues or whatever so if you if you think you'd be interested do let us know happy to sign you up and show, show your details of marketing and then you'll we're doing everything as webinars at the moment but when we're eventually back to the office there are often croissants involved so <laughs> if <laughs> that's always an incentive for me <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Rachel and Megan for giving your time and it, and it was so clear and um, calmly delivered. Um, we gave a yoga analogy before we started about <laughs> the topic of legal structures being like the foundations of an organization, like the foundations of a yoga move. And you have to get that right in order for everything else to flow. Um, and so I think the yoga analogy has flowed through in the, the <laughs> lovely calm way in which Rachel and Megan have delivered so so thank you so much to both of you um, and thanks to Vanessa, Alison, Hannah and Naomi for um, being a small but perfectly formed um, set of attendees for this session. Um, I mentioned at the beginning um, I know some of you have already expressed interest in the Innovation Award um, but if you are interested in it you want to know more there's a session um, tomorrow at 11am on developing your idea led by previous award winners and 
and one on Friday um, at five o'clock um, for teachers and leaders taking your school based initiatives forward. So um, about the Innovation Award. And then if you want to ask any questions, just get in touch with the team. Cheyenne is our wonderful head of Innovation Award as well. He'll be able to answer any questions. So, so let us know. And it's this is the type of thing you will get through um, the programme as well as the £15,000 support and connections with, with the fellow members. Um, so yes, uh, so uh, we hope you're enjoying the festival so far. So we'll do a quick poll, um, which Ellie will just launch now, um, just to get your immediate feedback on this session. And then we will close the session mm -hmm. and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. We've got a great session coming up this afternoon um, in the main room on addressing racial inequalities in education head on, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then some more, um, uh, as I mentioned, there's the more award winner um, sessions across the across the week as well. So take a look at your timetables and I hope to see you at a few more sessions. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. meet you all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Megan. Thanks all. Bye. Tens all round, guys. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>